coming in today and taking your time out in your busy schedule to do this. I understand and appreciate that you have a lot on. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Sean. Always is. And we have a lot to talk about. We do. Don't, don't we? And my computer decided to go off um, oh, and then decided to play silly games just then. Now, there's a few things that I want to talk about. And as I said, uh, in the off-air, the controlling legacy of the Liberal Labor bloc with things like the wasted of money on the Hawkesbury uh, County Council media policy and the attack on Hawkesbury Council Watch, a Facebook post which we know that you've got some sort of interconnection with with your family. Um, and they wasted 50 minutes of council time in May, which was limited time, on a nothing issue. That, that, that's true. Look, uh, firstly, I've got to preface my remarks by saying I only represent myself here as a councillor and as a candidate, and I'm not a spokesperson for council. And the other thing I'd say is that uh, when we reflect at this time in the political cycle about council and its performance, we've got to be careful that we're not rushing to judgment about council staff or council as an organisation. What people are being invited to do in a few weeks' time is cast judgment on the elected chamber, which is the leadership of the organisation. And I think it's very proper for people to do that, but also to make that distinction. I really want to leave it all on the field here with you today, <laughs> because with an election only a couple of weeks away, I wanted to kind of take this opportunity in talking with you to kind of canvas what I think are the really significant issues that people need to think about. And the elephant in the room is the current leadership. Yeah. Liberal and Labor combined have backed each other in for mayor and deputy mayor and have controlled the chamber for the last for 17 of the last 20 years. So one of those was Rex Stubbs all the way back when, and then more recently we had a two-year stint with, with Mary Lyons Bucket. But in, at every other time, Liberal and Labor have had uh, control of the chamber. And sometimes that's a bare majority, because if a vote was split six all, it's the casting vote of the mayor. And what's distinguished this term of council is that the divisions have been so sharp, the casting vote of the mayor has been used far more far more than it would. In my view, if a mayor in the chair is in a position of needing to use their casting vote because the vote was so evenly split, to me that would be a signal that that was a sign for the need for more work, to go away and to find a broader consensus around an issue rather than to ram something through with the barest of majorities. That's not what we've seen. We've seen things rammed through. And the other thing is that in an area where at other levels of government, the Liberal and the Labor voters tend to cleave to that brand. Yep. And it's the, only, it's the only game in town, really. I mean, mm. we know that either Labor or Liberal are going to be in government at any you know, given point in time. I want to encourage people to think of council as different. Council shouldn't be a venue for party politics. In fact, I remember when I was a member of the Liberal Party, there was an eminent persons report chaired by John Howard, of no, no less, that looked at the state of our party and where we should focus our energies. He came back pretty solidly and said, the Liberal Party shouldn't be contesting local government campaigns because the issues that the Liberal Party, where the Liberal Party values are at the fore, are state and federal issues. Yeah. You could say that running candidates at local government level fosters new talent, but that hasn't necessarily been the case <laughs> without... No, without it's our, not. Yeah. So my first message is to people who really do want to vote Liberal, who aren't receptive even to our plea to kind of vote independent. I mean, I'm an ex-Lib, but I'm proudly an independent now, and they really want to go out in there and vote Liberal or vote Labor. And my message to those people is the Liberal Party isn't the Liberal Party that you remember. The Labor Party isn't the Labor Party that you remember. No. They're, they're nepotistic sewers where factional grace and favour is given to people, backed by head office. This kerfuffle that they had recently, the Liberal Party, about failing to get their paperwork in. It turns out that after a bit of analysis, that that failure to either... It's a factual wall. Yeah, to, to either get a paperwork in on time or miraculously get it through was purely factional. In other words, if you were at head office and you had a factional axe to grind and you wanted to get two-thirds of your competitors out of the game altogether, just forget to f submit their paperwork. Yeah. And the Electoral Commission, about, you know, deadline is a hard deadline. If you want to vote Liberal, vote below the line and skip over the people who haven't been performing, who are inwardly focused, who are consumed by their own personal dramas, who don't have the temperament or the character. If you're a Labor voter, vote below the line 
and mm. bring some fresh faces into council. Yeah, that's it. And apart from that, our plea is, well, you know, good independence. I'm not here simply to paddle my own canoe here. I'm Group H and I'm hopeful that people will vote for me and Donna Pellew, who's a wonderful local businesswoman of many years standing. She'd be an absolute asset to council. But to also talk up the prospects of my fellow independents who I want to tell your listeners are people that I can work with. Yeah. Mary Lyons Bucket, um, Shane Durick, uh, Les Shaver, Angela Maguire would be a fresh face on council. Yes. She's got so much experience and skill. I'd love to see her on council. And I've got to um, apologise to Angela because our computer crashed last week and uh, I can't get her show up online. I've got this now, so the all show will be up online. Rob's will be up online yeah. and I've got to so, apologise to Angela. So my message to your listeners is the tone of council counts for a lot. Mm. If you've got people that are so calcified into their views and so riven with personal animosities and so forth, is that the chamber cannot function mm. and that they're not receptive to the views of others, then change the leadership. I'm endlessly upbeat about the ability of an election to change the complexion and the effectiveness of council. Look at what's happened during the last two terms of council, but I'll try and focus on the most recent term. The Liberal and Labor bloc abolished our committee system. Yep. which meant that there were venues for members of the community who gave of their own skill and expertise to come in and assist council, whether it's in disability services or heritage or the environment or, or, or whatever. That's all gone. Yeah. They tried very hard to abolish the heritage committee and it was only because I dug my heels in. I was the swing vote on that night. And I said, I've spent five years on the Heritage Committee. It does the most wonderful work. If we had to pay the experts that give of their time freely because they love the area and they love heritage, if we had to pay them for their advice, we couldn't afford it. No. And you want to dispense with that. So we managed to save the Heritage Committee. We've got poor policy that don't reflect the aspirations of the community, like the Rural Boundary Clearing Code that gives developers um, laissez-faire the ability to just completely uh, fell trees uh, at, at the margins of their property, ostensibly to mitigate bushfire risk, but there's no, there's no independent assessment. It's purely self-assessed. There's no policeman on the beat to watchdog whether trees are being chopped down, whether they represent a koala habitat, because we don't have a koala mapping strategy. No. Nope. That it actually does do the job that it should be doing to, to mitigate bushfire risk. We've got fireys in the RFS who are saying, we've got very elaborate schemes already in train to push through fire trails and to do fire risk mitigation in a variety of areas, including up around Bilpin and Currajong. And this has been completely surpassed by this Rural Boundary Clearing Code, where the, where the only, where the only peri-urban council to opt into that to that policy. Exactly. We're the only peri-urban council that, that, you know, that doesn't have a koala strategy. No. And I'm thinking there are, there are so many wonderful koala habitats. We don't even know where they are. And we're doing these things that damage the environment and we can't even measure the impact because the Liberal and Labor bloc voted against the necessary funding for a koala mapping strategy. They voted against taking the advice of, of wiser heads, including in the RFS, to go slow or, or give the Rural Boundary Clearing Code a much, much more sceptical... Or, and I was going to say here, to just classify the Hawkesbury Environmental Network at putting a petition forward as a stunt. As a stunt. So, Councillor Cotlash, currently the lead candidate on the Labor ticket, and supposed environmental scientist, voting to dissolve the Hawkesbury River County Council, uh, yeah. an organisation that we are a foundation member of and have been since 1948. Yeah. So for the last 76 years, the HRCC, which for listeners that don't know, isn't Hawkesbury City Council. This is a separate four council body that looks after our waterway health because the yep. river goes through different LGAs and doesn't care what border it's traversing. And it's, and it's our, our actual drinking water supply for yeah. the other side of the river. So it's, it's Penrith, Blacktown, Hills and Hawkesbury Council. This organisation is headquartered in our LGA, the lion's share of the land that's covered in this four council area is, is in the Hawkesbury, and yet we only contribute an equal 25% to the running cost of that organisation. We get the most stupendously fantastic and beneficial deal out of having this organisation in our own LGA, doing work that otherwise we would have to perform at very much greater expense. It's a brains trust for environmental science. It's got an excellent reputation with all kinds of stakeholder groups, including Landcare, including the Hawkesbury Environment Network, including individual 
<coughs> landowners and farmers everywhere, from down here all the way up into the McDonnell Valley to control pest species and look after our waterway health. And Councillor Cotlash felt that her wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all of the other member councils well. and anybody else that's ever gone before to say that we should withdraw from that, seek its dissolution. Something that I might add, we cannot do by ourselves, it would take an act of parliament. It would take the intervention yeah. of the minister to devolve... Penny Sharp has to do that. Yeah, to devolve this 76-year-old organisation away. And, I might add, Councillor Cotlash says, oh, it's not going to cost us any money. We'll just take on that work ourselves. No, no, no. If, if this hits the minister's desk, the minister will come straight back to us and say, well, this is a demalgamation. And if you're proposing a demalgamation, you're going to have to fund the study and the business case to justify whether this is in the best interests of all of those exactly. member organisations. And that's going to cost us tens of thousands, and it will probably deliver... Uh, uh, a substandard uh, service. The, the conclusion that HRCC does incredibly good work. There are academic studies and world's best practice confirmation that shared service models where we share the responsibility for waterway health and weed control over a four-council area is an absolute no-brainer. And yet, Councillor Cotlash has been on the warpath about this. And I think that is not consonant with the values that a lot of Labor Party members and voters hold. No, and, and the, this is my take on it, because I've done a little bit of... I've done a few stories on it, and I've read into it, and I've looked at it, and I've talked to the people. Basically, she finished up with the Hawkesbury River County Council on the 16th of June. That motion was brought as urgent business at 3.30 on the last... on the July meeting, which means no-one had a chance to speak. It was basically a problem between her and the administrative... Uh, admin people, the general manager, I'm not going to mention his name on here, um, there's a disagreement there, and she's decided to have a square up. Amanda is having a square up, an old-fashioned square up, and she's done it before, I know, because I've been on the receiving end of a square up with her. And at the end of the day, this is a personal issue. She got paid for her time on the council, and she's got another uh, conflict of interest with Landcare because she is the greater Sid uh, Western Sydney's Landcare representative. You can just look it up on the Facebook post, and they delete that very, very, very quickly when it's mentioned because they don't want to see that conflict of interest. Amanda has to have a long, hard think about her own personal issues. Mm. Is she working for the community or is she working for her own ego? Which is why, which is why I'm saying for, for those Labor voters out there that might be listening in, Consider that position that you've got a pair of Labor councillors, C Councillor Calvert and Councillor Cotlash, who have consistently backed the Libs in way too often, including on issues relating to development, and uh, are, are not honouring the values that people would think of as traditional Labor Party values. Yeah. So if they're going to vote Labor, vote below the line, skip over the people you don't like, bring some fresh faces in. And to my Liberal voting friends, I would say, and I've said this many times, there should be no conflict between being a good conservative, and I am a good conservative, and being a good conservationist. No. The, the, the words are related for a reason. And being a good environmental steward is simply what we do as good citizens to hand a district over to the, the, the next generations that's in a better state than we found it. If we, if we subdivide and build out and get rid of our agricultural and equine lands, and if we make the Hawkesbury look like what we see when we drive down Windsor Road at Box Hill and Carmel and all the rest of it, oh. where it's just an anthill. It's a yeah. complete anthill. It is a tragedy. It's a rat race. And to, to do this to the Hawkesbury would be an act of sheer vandalism. And that's not to say that independents dig their heels in and say no to everything. I'm not a NIMBY. I really want to see the, the Hawkesbury develop economically to be a hub for employment, for it to be a hub for tourism. I want people to take a real pride in what we've got. We've got the most wonderful heritage where Sydney's playground and where Sydney's food basket out here at the Perry Urban Fringe. You can jump on a train and get into the city in an hour, or you can relax on an acreage property, grow alpacas and have a B&B, &B and exactly. you know, go skiing on the river and do all of the lovely things. And yet I think frequently we sell ourselves short. Mm. And I think there's a poverty mentality, and there's a poverty mentality in council. Some people have said, oh, Hawkesbury Council, it's so unresponsive, it's where people go to die in terms of their career, because we don't have the, the exciting development that Blacktown or Penrith or Hills have. And I'm saying, no, that's not, that's not a slur on us. We, we have reasonable development. We have plans to uh, stimulate our economy, to stimulate our tourism, to make this place a pleasant place to live, to invest judiciously in services, but we've got a real problem. Council is going to face a financial crunch. 
Yes. And, and, and one of the things that I want to take the opportunity to raise with you and your listeners is the fact that here we are at the cusp of an election, and I seem to be the only councillor, the only candidate, that's talking about council's financial position. Well, well one I'm, that actually knows. Sorry, Eddie does talk about it to keep you know, that I'm, very I'm, well. I'm, I'm, going to make, I'm going to make a prediction. In the coming term of council, staff will come to us and they'll say, our financial situation is so dire, we're going to need to make an application for another special rate variation. Now, listeners will remember that council voted to jack up everybody's rates in 2017 by over a third. I did not vote for that rate rise on that occasion. I didn't think that it was justified. Now, I think that we've really got to have this debate before the election. Otherwise, if we're being invited to vote for a rate rise after the election, we won't have a mandate. People will justifiably come to us and they'll say, well, nobody talked about this during the election and yet you want to jack up everybody's rates by another 20 or 30%. Yeah, well, I've got to ask this question, and sorry, this is a bit out of left field. In November's meeting, I vaguely remember we had an external audit that came through to check the financial health. Mm -hmm. And it said that we were $34 million in the, in the black. Now, okay. that seems a little confusing. And I, I, and I was, during the next couple of months, so what, it's been November, we're probably 10 months, I've been slowly watching and it's been then dripping out that we've got, we can't afford to do this and we can't afford to do that. And it's, okay, then so that $35 million okay, figure so the, doesn't make sense. The difficulty sense. is this. Council tries very hard to balance its budget, but it's difficult to balance our budget in the current environment because we are still receiving a lot of largesse in the way of grants from West Invest for flood recovery money. There's even still the tail end of fire recovery money that's funding various capital projects. Mm -hmm. So you put that in your budget and everything looks fine, balanced budget. But these are one-off payments. payments that come to us and um, they're earmarked for a specific purpose. And once they're paid, the real financial situation becomes really apparent. And I think that it's worth talking about the fact that Liberal and Labor style themselves as the grown-ups in the room. They style themselves as the people that are more responsible with a budget oh, yeah, than definitely. an independent or a green or something like that. And yet they have failed to manage this council by the own metrics that they have set down. So, for example, listeners would be interested to know that council's debt has risen from $16.3 million only three years ago to over $62.5 million at the end of the last financial year. And that is a massive increase in debt, largely caused because of that loan that we had to take out to repair rising Main Sea, so, which was yeah. that single pipe that crosses South Creek and takes all the poo away from Windsor and South Windsor and sends yeah. it over to the sewage treatment plant in Mulgrave. So that's a huge increase in our debt. Uh, another metric that we're, where we've fallen behind is uh, our infrastructure backlog which is the money that we need on an ongoing basis to maintain not only our roads, but our parks and our footpaths and our lights and our libraries and our pools and all the rest of it. That's risen from 2.1% to 9.3%. And th the end game of these numbers is that within nine years, we are going to have a $162 million hole in our infrastructure. Now, people come to me, as they do to my colleagues, and they say the number one thing that we're worried about is the state of our roads. And we say, absolutely, we hear you. Yeah. I'm saying, I hear you. Roads are the absolute number one issue. They are. I'm telling listeners that council will shortly cease to be able to afford even basic maintenance on the bulk of our roads. And, and, and if, we, if there isn't some kind of an intervention, there'll be a $162 million hole in that program, just like there are holes in all of our roads. And that's really bad. But if we want to talk about another rate rise, we've got to talk about whether council acquitted the last rate rise in the way that they promised that they would. Mm. So case in point, 2017, there's this program out there to consult with the community and then vote through a 30 plus percent rate rise. And there was a list of capital projects that came with that. One of them was Sealing Packer Road, one of our really key, key. dirt roads. It's an east-west link well, between I'm... Lower Portland and, and, and the Party Road. And, it, you know, enormous... A young woman had died, a daughter, exactly. a sister, a friend had died on that road. And mm -hmm. to watch, to be in that room when the councillors and everyone got up and spoke, mm. you knew that there was a lot of turncoats and suddenly about faces real bloody quick yeah. when when the, the mother was in that room ready to stare every councillor that was going to go the other way down in the eye and say, are you that type of person? And suddenly they weren't that type of person, so, but they so, were yeah. behind so, so, closed so, doors. So to tell listeners what happened next is that 
we'd pledged to seal that road all the way back in 2017. I think it was before that. It was 2012, I think. Well, you know, well, it was, well, you know it, was, it was specifically earmarked as a project in association with the last rate rise, and that was in 2017. I know that much, because that's yeah. when I was in the chamber. And uh, it rolled forward to 2024, because things dragged their heels, and there's a report from council staff with the recommendation that we abandon that road sealing project. How on earth can council, as a chamber, go to the community and say, we want to jack up everybody's rates again if we've reneged on the promises that we made last time? We have zero credibility. Yeah. And the thing is, I, I haven't made up my mind about whether we should have another rate rise. Like I said, I voted against the last one, but I'm also alive to the concern of many people that our roads are in such a parlous state. I think that if we went to the community and we said, we will we will necessarily have to raise your rates again. This is beyond the rate peg to go even further. But we've got to do two things. One is that we've got to be very specific in terms of pledging the capital projects that are going to go with that. And the other thing is that we've got to reform our whole rating system so that that rate rise doesn't hit some sectors of the community unfairly. It wouldn't surprise you to know that there are suburbs in the Hawkesbury where there are two families. I'll pick two suburbs at random, Oakville and, say, Hobartville. I don't want to pick on those people, but it's illustrative. These families might have the same income, they might have the same demographic profile, they might access the same degree of community services from council in terms of rubbish collection, go to the pool, go to the library, play in the parks, all the rest of it. And yet this community here on an acreage property in Oakville, for example, is paying two or three times the amount of rates. Yeah. And that's not fair. And council have tried to alter the rating formula. We have what's called a base rate. We're not allowed to alter it beyond the 50% level. There are some colleagues of mine that would want to pair that back and amplify those inequities. We've tried to move those inequities back to the... the, the we've moved the, the lever as far as the state government will allow us, but there are other things that we could do with our rating structures, like restoring the, res the rural residential rate or creating communities of affinity. A bunch of stuff that was in a report that came from IPART about how council structures their rates. And there's a book called the Revenue and Rating Manual. It's the guidebook for how councils levy taxes and then allocate them. And what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to be uh, aware of not only the, the needs of the community, but people's ability to pay. And we're totally out of whack with people's ability to pay. So none of the other candidates or tickets are spending any time talking about a prospective rate rise, because that's a no-no, that's a nasty. And yet I'm saying, how is the next chamber going to have any credibility unless they're raising and discussing this issue with the community Which now? Which they have to. And I might add, I am still the only councillor, and probably the only candidate, that's that spent the last eight years making videos to explain these issues. And the subject matter is occasionally very dry. Rates and, you know... You know. Local, clan, local council is not glamorous. Who, who, who cares? But people have a right and an obligation to pay attention to this because exactly. it has a measurable effect in terms of the quality of life that people enjoy in our area. And um, it, I have a, an email newsletter that reaches many, many thousands of people. I've got a website where I explain things. I've got a social... I know not everybody's a social media person, but I make an effort to go out onto social media and to really explain these issues. Some of my council colleagues, who are more experienced than I am, have never really bothered to do that, and I've never quite understood... That, that is, is a sad situation on that too. It, it means that they're just not sort of uh, paying attention to those very needed topics because we need to know whether we're going to go into administration. And this is my big fear. Mm -hmm. If we, if the voting public don't pay attention and they fall asleep at the wheel, they'll end up like the Central Coast. Oh, no, I agree. I mean, council will argue for hours on end about whether we can fund another $5,000 to do an animal desexing program because we've got, we've got an epidemic of kittens yeah. in, the, in the, the, the local animal shelter. And we'll, we'll argue about whether we can afford to fund a koala mapping program, something that's of critical importance to an endangered you know, ecological community in the Hawkesbury. And yet the Sydney Morning Herald had a story last week that ranked the councils for the number of code of conduct complaints that were oh, made win that one. by by councillors against other councillors or by members of the public against councillors. And we're a pretty small potatoes council. We're number two in that list. How good are we? There were 23 individual code of conduct complaints. God. Uh, which cost Shame. council $96,500. Now, I'm not allowed to talk about code of conduct complaints, but I can tell you most of them were against me and most of them were brought by the mayor. And that's just stupid because of all of the things that we could have been spending that money on.
Yeah. I really think that the public should feel sick and tired about that kind of, you know, brittleness. Well, it's and, and we it's, need to move past that because here's me trying to get a positive message for how the Hawkesbury is a wonderful place to live, and just you wait and see what a really effective council looks like when wait for it, is a radical idea, where everybody in that chamber actually like each other and get along with each other and are prepared to work collaboratively for the community and engage in a bit of give and take yeah. about things that they might not agree on and find an equitable solution. That's my dream. We don't have that at the moment, and that's because there are some bad eggs on council that and we need to get rid there of. There is some bad eggs, and then I call them Jersey fillers. They barely say two words, right, and then they'll come up with this... Li- right out of left field, like, I think we should just not, we just push it down the road, or I think we should stop this. And it's mm-hmm. like, you've never said a word before. I'm not going to mention who it is. Mm. And now suddenly you're going to throw this comment out and everyone goes, yeah, that's that's weird um, and totally irrelevant to the topic we're talking about, but, yep, we're going to go with it. The, set, the thing that gets me with this is you've got, uh, you, you've, you've touched on the pro- pro- prospect of, People in the room don't like each other. That's fine, but as a team, you don't have people that like each other, but you want to work together because you've got a common goal, the best for the Hawkesbury. What I'm seeing is the common goal is totally irrelevant. It's my ego or what I want to get out of this. It's not what you can serve the community. like, like, Like I said, I don't agree with my colleagues all the time. We are on a political spectrum, and I'm not pretending that that doesn't exist, but I'm prepared to sit here and say that uh, let's let's pick an example. Daniel Wheeler. You're totally opposite I've, ends. I've I've sat I've sat next to Daniel Wheeler uh, in council for for years now. We disagree violently on a variety of issues. I mean, here's me right of centre, and she's distinctly left of centre, and good on her. But I can say, hand on heart, she is the smartest person in the room. E- exactly, I agree with that. 100%. And I have never seen a more diligent and passionate councillor. Again, we disagree. And there's a variety of things where we would vote on opposite sides. But the thing is, I give her her due as a passionate, effective, intelligent advocate. And she is an asset to this council. And even though we won't agree on things all the time, I want to see her return to council. I don't agree with Mary all the time. I want to see her return to council. I don't agree with Les all the time. He sides with the libs too often, for my opinion. But, but, you know, his heart for the community, his willingness to just muck in and put on a high-vis vest... talk to anyone. ...and manage traffic or, you know usher at the door or, you know, have a yarn with people. You, you and I both know there's no such thing as a short conversation with Les no. Jeter. <laughs> of course, he knows everybody and he's well regarded by everybody. I want him back in the chamber, yeah. just like I want to see some fresh blood like Angela or Bob Gribben or, or, or these other people that I think might improve. And it's what's going on behind the scenes that I want to draw to people's attention. Um, as I pioneered and co-founded a, a Facebook group called Hawkesbury City Councillor Watch, Yep. We felt the need to do that because the Liberal and Labor bloc rescinded a measure that I had passed earlier, which uh, asked staff to kind of maintain an attendance register. Now, everybody sees when a councillor turns up to a chamber meeting, because that's in the public gaze, so everyone's yep. on their best behaviour. But I can tell you that two-thirds of the meetings that councillors attend and are obliged to attend, it's not a rule, but it's like, this is part of the job, please turn up, occur out of the public gaze. In the last three years, there were 44 chamber meetings, which is fewer than there would have been because the Liberal and Labor bloc voted to halve the number of chamber meetings which that we were holding. Is it poor? But uh, during the same period of time, there were 83 other meetings that were outside the public gaze. We're talking about briefings. We're talking about workshops. We're talking about round tables. We're talking about citizenship ceremonies. We're talking about field trips to different parts of the Hawkesbury where we need to inspect something so that we can have a better idea of what what's going on there to meet members of the community. 83 of those. So it's fair to say that two-thirds of our meetings are outside the public gaze. When the eye of the public aren't on those councillors, how good's their attendance? I'm pleased to be able to say that my attendance is among the best of of any of the councillors. I turn up to everything. But there are councillors that that didn't turn up much at all. Councillor Dogramachi talks big, but he only attended 38% of these necessary meetings yeah. that other councillors think of as, as as part of their core business. Exactly. And like, there's, there's no rule that says he, he simply must. It's just the community's expectation. We're paying our councillors a modest sum to be elected representatives. Go to the, me- go to the damn meetings and be- become well-informed about the issues. They're gonna be coming to the chamber a couple of weeks later. So when a councillor 
asks a boneheaded question in the chamber, as we occasionally yes, know occurs, we do. <laughs> it's usually because that councillor hasn't been there when these matters were briefed by council staff, we were given PowerPoints, we were given all of the statistics, we were asked to read our briefing paper, somebody just decides that, that, that that's not for them because they know better. Councillor Calvert only came to 50% of those briefings. Councillor Connolly only came to 52% of those briefings and he spent some of that time as the mayor. Councillor Cotlash only turned up to 72% of those meetings, whereas there's a range of other councillors, and I'll put myself in this category, where their attendance is between like 95 and 100%. And there, was, and there were times where if we weren't present for a meeting, it's because uh, one of the councillors was in hospital and still attended that meeting from their Zoom. hospital bed by Zoom, or they'd been delegated to go to a conference on behalf of council, and that's why they weren't present, but they yeah. were still engaged in, in, council council, business. in council business. And I think it's, it's disappointing, it's cynical, for people to seek the sinecure of election to council when they haven't come to meetings. Think of the aspirants that are you know, coming out of the woodwork now. There are Liberal Party people who who, you know, say, you know, vote for me. They're given a winnable spot on council, but who's heard of them? Yeah. What's their engagement with the community? Our mayor said that she knew everything that there was to know about small business because she started a Facebook page once. Oh, right. Oh, whereas, okay. Let, whereas, whereas the number two, the number two candidate on my ticket is a, a very formidable local businesswoman who's been running a retail shop, uh, like a florist and, and a wedding planning thing, for decades and kept the doors of that business it's, open through COVID. And that's not a small open. fee. That's it, a, no, that's, it's, it's that in, means you're down in the trenches, in, you're fighting incredible hard. Thing. I want people of good temperament, good character and formidable intellect to join me on council so that we can run this council and this community in the way that people expect. And at the moment, they're not getting their money's worth. No, and, and that's my, my biggest gripe with it. And that's part of what I do with this radio program is because I want to expose what good work is. Because mm -hmm. on council, it's good work. As you said, you touched on it. They don't turn up. They don't read the business paper. In certain cases, you know they don't read the business paper. You can just see it. Like I I spend, to do this program, it's a three-hour program, I'll spend probably about five to seven hours a week reading, researching, sorting stuff out to get this because it's going to be a half, uh, I say half decent because I'm still amateur. I'm not professional. I don't get paid. You do well enough. <laughs> it's it. <laughs> but the same, the same thing with the council is, this is not a full-time gig for you. It's you've, You're a school teacher. People have their own jobs. That's 100% mm. certain, right? But if you're going to do something where you're representing the community and you're taking it serious and you're part of a team, you have to turn up to certain presentations. You have to turn up to certain information sessions. You have to read the business paper. You have to read the external attachments that go with that business paper and maybe, just maybe, do some site visits, maybe also do some external research, mm. maybe get a differing of opu uh, opinion or views on things to make sure that you're executing your decision and your plan and your vision for the community 100%. I thoroughly agree. Otherwise, you're just taking the piss out of everyone. Mm. Sorry to be blatantly obvious, you're just wasting everyone's time. Mm. And that's where I like, and as you said with Danielle Wheeler, 100%. You and Danielle Wheeler are on the opposite ends of the spectrum, and she is one of the most intelligent people in the room besides yourself and Mary Bucket Lyons, um, who put in that work effort. That work effort is the big thing where you're presenting motions to the public in their interest. People can come to you and say, I have this problem. Can you solve it? That's where Susan Templeman's really good because people come to her with council issues about trees. Exactly. And so, she advocates for them. So, it's not even her responsibility. So before we went on air, we were talking about an issue and I'm saying I'm sympathetic to this, but I don't think that this is something that's going to come to the chamber and won't get a vote in the chamber. But we still listen and we advocate on behalf on, on any issue, even if we've got to kind of pass that on to Robin Preston or, or Susan Templeman. I understand that. And I think the way that the chamber ends up with the wrong mix of people is because people don't understand the voting system and that they're lazy. Now, mm. when people get their ballot paper, it's going to say, put one above the line or number at least six below. Now, I've got to say, that's, that's a totally legal vote. And in fact, the Liberal and Labor Party will issue a how to vote that says one, one and done. And I want to invite listeners to realise that that's very cynical because it's inviting people to throw away more than half the power of their vote. Yep. They are not electing one or two lucky souls from one ticket that gets their one above the line and that's it. 
people are electing a chamber of 12, which means that they should be numbering lots of squares, not the minimal amount, and certainly not following the how to vote of the Liberal or Labor Party that says one and done. They are electing a chamber of 12. There was a third of the chamber, Councillor Kotlash, Councillor Dogramachi, Councillor Jurek, and Councillor Shiva fell over the line, didn't even get a quota. Quota's the normal threshold that you'd have to reach in yeah. order to be elected to the chamber. The only reason that they were elected is because they fell over the line, because as the preference count goes on and candidates get eliminated from the bottom up, they were last man standing. It was yeah. the, they were simply the ones that were in the field and every other candidate had been eliminated. There were still four slots to populate and there were only four candidates left in the mix. So they just lapse in. And that was Councillor Kotlash. Didn't get a quota. And... Uh, if people number all the squares, that means that their vote stays alive. Their vote doesn't extinguish early. It means that their vote not only contributes to the person who they've given their first preference to, but it stays in the mix and it gets past the parcel around to other candidates that that voter might have wanted to see on council, even at the tail end, what we say, down the ballot. And we want people to vote to vote above the line and number all the squares. They've only got to count to 10. There's only 10 tickets this time. Most yeah. people can count to 10. Yes, most. Well, I've got all my fingers <laughs> still, so we're, we're good. Or, <laughs> if they're minded to vote below the line, number way more than six. I mean, I've yeah. said 20, but the more the better. Yeah. If you can keep a coherent sequence going so that your voting intention is you know, explicable to the Electoral Commission, <laughs> you know, number a bunch of squares, skip over the losers that you don't want to see returned yeah. to council or elected to council, and then put together a, a, a ticket of 12 that you'd want to see working together exactly. for the benefit of the community. And that's a really hard message to get out there. Only a certain percentage of people vote below the line. There's a certain percentage of people that vote informal because they couldn't quite grasp that system. And the other thing is, polling day is on the 14th of September, whatever the Saturday is. Mm. Is it the 14th or the 15th? I it's the 14th. 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 But, uh, but uh, pre-poll starts a week early from the 7th. So from Saturday the 7th, you can go to one of the two pre-poll locations, which is Windsor Library or Richmond School of Arts, and you can cast your vote early. A record number of people voted uh, early last time, and we expect that that percentage is going to increase even more. Um, we think that easily more than a third of people are going to cast their vote early. And people can feel great confidence in going to do that. Their vote will be counted. And they don't police whether you've got a legitimate reason to vote early. It's like, oh, are you going away? Are you going to be in hospital? But no, no, you, you, they just hand you your ballot paper. I want to tell people to come and vote early because it means that you're definitely going to see me at one of those two pre-poll locations. And I want to meet with people and I want to hand them my flyer and have a yarn with them about what they direction they want to see council go in. Whereas for an independent like me, my resource is limited. I can't promise that I'm going to have every booth manned on polling day yeah. and to get my message out there and to say to them, please vote for Group H and here are some people that I'd be prepared to work with. Well, I can tell you now from my last uh, council uh, election, Glossodia only had one team manned mm -hmm. with a big flyer and everyone else is not there. And it yeah. was really disappointing. It was like, where, and it does play where, a part. It, who it, are these independents? <coughs> who are these people I'm voting for? I've got no idea. It does play a part in, in letting people understand who you favour on your how to vote. Now, the how to vote, people, I've had so many emails saying, where do you send your preferences? And I'm saying, I don't send my preferences anywhere. You do. Your vote is yours. You number those squares in the way that you want to. Here's my how to vote. That's only a recommendation. These are the people that I feel I can work with that yeah. would make a positive counsel moving forward. But if people disagree with that, I'm not twisting their arm, and it's not as though if they put a one above the line, I'm then dictating what happens afterwards. It's up to them. If people put one above the line and then stop, they've voted for that ticket, and maybe the one or two that maybe creep over the line from that column, and then the power of their vote is wasted otherwise. Exactly. So I didn't want to waste the opportunity to, to remind people about the importance of numbering many squares, either above or below the line, not both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm... I'm already going to be below below the line, um, and I know that because, as you said, I understand very well that if above the line to me is a waste, below the line I get to pick the team. It's mm. like my dream pick. Mm. All right, I'm going to pick this player, this player, this player, and they're all going to turn up, I, I hopefully, wanna... or they're going to get every opportunity that I can give them. I want to serve on council with people that respect our heritage, that want appropriate development but aren't in the pockets of developers and want to promote inappropriate development. I want to be on council with people that aren't at war with the local media. No. Who don't declare the media to be, Got like, it. the enemy of the state, like like they're Donald Trump. 
Yeah. And I'm thinking our local journalistic organs, be it the Hawkesbury Independent or the Hawkesbury, Hawkesbury Post, Post or Hillsborough Pulse, Hawkesbury. Pulse. Pulse. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, we've got to play nice. Like, we, and that's we've one got of the candidates things. in the field that will refuse to take part in a Meet the Candidates thing or will refuse to give their bio or... Uh, an interview to the local media because they're offside with the local media. And I'm thinking, what a way, what a way to govern. I mean, in it's politics 101. Be on good terms with the media, respect their independence uh, and their autonomy and their right to report on things that you might find unpalatable. Yeah. If you if you don't want the media to report on you doing stupid things... Don't do them. Just stop doing stupid things. <laughs> it's exactly right. I <laughs> learned this a long yeah. time. I learned this in high school. If you don't yeah. want to get in trouble for stuff, don't do it. Yeah. If you're going to get in trouble, work out the cost. Is the cost worth you... You know, I want to do this. Well, what's the cost? I'm going to get in trouble. Is that cost worth doing this? Yeah. Yes, no, don't do it. We're going to have to take a quick break because we've got to keep the lights on. Anyway, getting back to, we've talked about this off air, but the big thing was that, um, what's it called? It, we've got the Oasis um, situation here with the caravan park. Oh, sorry, I'm distracted. All right, focus. Right. The Middle Islands uh, Oasis Development Caravan Park up in Currajong Hills. Mm -hmm. Now, it's at the state level planning right now. Yes. And I thinking uh, we've just had the, recently the uh, sale of the Wilberforce Painting Club, mm -hmm. in which was done behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So we've lost in three years. Effect effectively, we'll lose an asset. Well, I'll correct you there. The council voted to sell that land, but it was immediately the subject of a recession motion, which we'll come back to the next council meeting. So oh. it's it's almost unique to have a recession motion bridge council chambers. And it really sharpens people's focus because it means that if people want to save that pony club land, then they've got to elect a different council. Because if it comes back to a council with the same complexion that we have at the moment, the, the vote will go the same way. But if they change the complexion of council, that matter will be revisited. Just like there's a recession motion in about seceding from the Hawkesbury River County Council. That will come to the first meeting of the new chamber in the middle of October. And by then, I hope, the chamber will have a different complexion. Well, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to keep... I think Amanda Kotlash might be... Her day might be done. She's used up all the good faith with the, the die-hard Labor people. Um, the, the thing that I was going to put forward was that with this development uh, proposal, it's at the state thing, and we don't, and we don't have the Kuala Management Plan, as we've said, and that's not rescinded, but... I suggest with this, and this is what my, my vision is, that the council goes to these developers and says, listen, we want to have a wildlife refuge, ecotourism. That's the first building, first building, mm -hmm. not the last, not the mm -hmm. one after we've built everything. No, it's the very first, which is manned and probably funded by the state government, the federal government and the local government, tri-partnership. So if we could advocate that for wildlife conservation. So while they do build that development for ecotourism, which is what it's selling itself for, that they've got the capability of looking after injured wildlife as it comes in, as they're developing, to make sure that, that when they're doing the construction work that they are doing the right thing and they are providing the checks and balances to provide for the wildlife and their habitat. The second one is, if that uh, Wilberforce uh, Pony Club does go through and it isn't rescinded, that they have their new home at this place because part of the development pro proposal at the state level is it's for horse riding trails. It's a no-brainer to me. Yeah, and what you do is, more broadly, you look for those kinds of intelligent compromises in the sense that I wouldn't have voted for the Red Bank development, which was tainted by all kinds of corruption and it came yeah, before ICAC. Yeah, dirty you know, deals. Yeah, but nevertheless, when that went through, the VPA had a variety of improvements for the community, chief of which was the construction of the Gross River Bridge. Yeah, now, now that we, was after it. We need we, to have it before. We, We're we, not this we, time We still, we still don't have a bridge over the Gross River. Exactly. Don't, because don't, don't get me started. But the point is, if you're going to have development, you've got sweeteners that are built in that have to be built at the expense of those developers, which make it more palatable. Now, I, I can't say in advance whether I would support this particular proposal in Currajong Hills. I was actually in Currajong Hills yesterday. I was in Currajong Hills, Currajong Heights and Bilpin doing some letterboxing. I actually got actually got bogged. I, I was coming up Old Bells Liner Road, which is a really steep dirt yeah, road, yep. and I got stuck, and then some locals had to winch me out. 
<laughs> so, so I know this area better than I did yesterday, I can tell you. And I don't know whether this is something that's going to come to the Chamber. This could be a state level decision. It could go to a planning panel. And the Chamber might not be able to weigh in. What I can say is that I'm now a member of this Facebook group that's expressing concern about this. And I'm listening very keenly, very diligently to feedback from the community about what their opinion about this is. Now, in other, instead of being somebody that just stands in the way of all development all the time, if, if, if it were up to me, and it probably won't be, but if it were up to me, I'd be sitting down with all of those stakeholders and saying, what can the community get out of this? Because exactly. if there's nothing for the community in a proposed development, why would any government, local or state, say yes? Because we're not here to line the pockets or create profits for developers. No. We're here to build a community, mm. to build something that's praiseworthy for generations to come. So if we can take some of that money and build a community asset that we couldn't otherwise afford ourselves, or if we could afford to rehome somebody that was about to be dislodged from their digs and we could give them better digs, yeah. then I'm all ears. I don't know the details of this particular proposal, and that's because it hasn't come to the Chamber and might not come to the Chamber. But the principle that you've laid out about there being a bit of intelligent give and take, and then, again, to cite Red Bank as the example, if there are these sweetness, sweetness that are inked in, Council has to have the spine to follow it through and hold the developers to that. Yeah. There is a list, as long as my arm, of sweeteners, improvements to the community that were promised by the Johnson Property Group at Pitt Town, which they never saw. Yeah, exactly. Keith Johnson promised the world and delivered an atlas, a yeah. very small atlas, and to the people of Pitt Town about oh, riverside walks and a new boat ramp and repairing Mulgrave Station car park and making some improvements to turning lanes on, on Pitt Town Road. And very little of that has happened. And very that's, little. And that's why I said it has to done before. Because we all know, and I've worked in the building industry, what happens with a lot of developers, and it's happened with uh, Nazif, who has the Box Hill... Uh, what's it called, shopping centre he was supposed to develop, he's going bust. These have to be done first, not after we've sold a few houses. No, no, mate, you do it first because you've got money. We know you do, right? These have to be done first so then you can build your community around it, not Precisely. build the community first, then put these things yeah. in afterwards. Yeah, look at what's happening elsewhere, especially, you know, down Windsor Road. They build these dormitory suburbs and then the community infrastructure, whether it's rail, you know, rail, bus, whatever, schools, takes another decade or more to catch up, which is why Oakville Public School on our side of the line is absolutely bursting at the seams. And I know this because I went to that school, my nephews go to that school now, and it's bursting at the seams. A lot of the people coming into that school are from the other side of Boundary Road in Box Hill North, yep. Carmel, Gables, because there's no there's no there's no public primary school, school in that area. The government waves generally towards building something in the future, but the people are living there now, and they need that community infrastructure there. Exactly. Now they needed it there five years ago. The same with Marsden Park. No school, no nothing. There's St Luke's. It was there, but then they were, yeah, you know, they didn't have a public school. They should have been putting that public school in, or having that already started. You know, let's have it going yeah. you know, so before this, we so, get developed. So this is where I part company and where I'm, I've very comfortably parted company with my with some of my colleagues, especially in the Liberal Party. Some of my colleagues in the Liberal Party have never seen a development they didn't like. Whereas I'm saying, you know what, I don't want to be a NIMBY, but I do want to make sure that the, com the, 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 the public get the deal that they were promised yeah. out of something and that infrastructure comes first and rather than as an afterthought, yeah. sometimes lagging by more than a decade. People that are caught in that congestion between Richmond and North Richmond, day in and day out, should be absolutely incandescent with anger at a succession of governments, both state and local, that have let that happen without there being the required amplifications to a crossing of the Hawkesbury River that, that goes around North Richmond, not dumping that traffic back into North Richmond, or that gives us uh, the extra ability to get across the Grouse River and then join Hawkesbury Road at Yarramundi so that can go up to the Blue Mountains or, or go across to Penrith or whatever. That should have happened years ago and there's now thousands of extra houses and, as we discovered earlier this year, prospect um, proposals in the pipeline for another seven, seven or eight, eight thousand, thousand houses. houses on the other side of the river. I'm saying no to that. Well, I'm not saying no to it, but if you want to build them, we've got to get a hospital, <coughs> we've got to get a fire station, we've mm. got to have a police station on the other side of the river. That's the deals. If you don't have them first, forget your other ones because you're not getting them. That's that's where I'm at. 
look, we're going to have to stop there because we've got uh, Bob Griffin coming in. Thank you very much for your time. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to seeing the polling day. I hope to catch up with you afterwards and having many long chats with you about what Council's doing. But now we have to stop, give the news, take a word from our sponsors and move on. Best of luck. Always a pleasure. Thank Group you for coming. Group H. Group H for Hawks, Hawksbury. Group H for Hawksbury. Thank you.